are so excited to have all of you here tonight. I'm Roberta Islip. I'm the president of the Friends of the Library and happy to welcome you to our speaker series. I especially want to thank our newest board member, Ellen White, who thinks the only reason she was invited on the board is because she knows Sam Sipkin. <laughs> but we won't say that's true. Um, but she did promise to ask her husband, Paul, who's back there incognito, to take Sam fishing. And that's how we lured him down here. So thank you, Paul, and thank you, Brandon. Yeah, <laughs> we're sorry about the weather. Our generous and delightful speaker this evening is Sam Sifton. He is an assistant managing editor of the New York Times, the founding editor of the New York Times Cooking, and a former restaurant critic for the New York Times. Among other books, he's the author of See You on Sunday and the New York Times Cooking No Recipe Recipes. And Ellen T. White will be grilling him tonight, or I should say interviewing, <laughs> grilling him. Yeah. She's the former managing editor of the New York Public Library and the author of Simply Irresistible Lessons in Love from the Most Famous and Infamous Women in History. So thank you to you both. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Roberta. I'm not used to a microphone, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, particularly out in the cold. At least it's not like it was last night. We would have been freezing. Uh, but Sam, we're so delighted to have you here because we've been planning this for months. And as you know, as it came closer and closer, it was like well, COVID, you know, but prevented. We never even considered that actually the weather in New York would have prevented it. I mean, did you just get out? <laughs> You just set out under yeah, because a lot of flights were canceled, etc. So, so you're here here now, and so I'm going to ask a few questions uh, of Sam, and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And we're not going to do the microphone thing. We're just going to um, just just say the question as loud as you can, and then I'll repeat it as best I can and interpret it. So, uh, so should we start? Let the grilling begin. begin. Okay. So. Sam, you've had a substantial career outside of food. Like, for instance, uh, you've had an editorial career with the New York, e editorial and, r and a writing career, I guess, uh, and as an editor and a writer. You, you worked for Talk Magazine and another magazine, American Heritage. You actually also, I read, were a teacher in the New York City schools. I was. Yeah. And you were a first mate on a schooner, I read. Yes, indeed. So, and even at the times, so you've been there for 20 years, but at least for some of that time, you were a national editor. Yes. But now you're involved with food. I mean, you're, you know, you're an assistant managing editor, but you're very involved with food. How did food happen? It, was it an interest you always had? Did you always want to go there? And, and describe also New York Times cooking, the, you know, the digital site. How Absol absolutely. Yeah. So food has been part of my journalism career from the very beginning. And I think that's because it was sort of accidental. New York Press, the newspaper I started out on, was a free alternative paper in New York City with the gigantic um, circulation of 100,000. I, like, I, I was 22 years old and I thought, a lot of people are reading what I'm getting to write. And uh, I ended up writing about food for that publication um, at, the, at the start of my career. They hired me as a, as a restaurant critic, and I was paid $150 a column, 750 words, and then I discovered that that included the meal. <laughs> so I was, I was not making a lot of money. Um, so that, that's what led me into the, into the school system for a while until I could become a full-time reporter and later editor. But that early experience of writing about food led me to believe, led me to understand, that food is always a way in. If you if if you if you want to start a conversation with anyone in a in a gas station, in a state house, in a in a beautiful library garden, you need only ask like, what'd you have for breakfast? Or what do you always have for breakfast? Or what was your lunch today? And you'll discover something that even the people 
who claim that they don't care about food, they don't think about food, they have nothing to say about food, have very definite ideas about food. And it starts with their breakfast. And so it, th that, that chance to be able to always start a conversation and always be able to get into some form of storytelling through food became important to me. And I kept it in my back pocket through every job I've done at the Times. It's always there for me. Um, most, I, as I should say, most intensely when I was the restaurant critic for the paper, obviously. Um, but, but even as national editor, I was forever, forever um, assigning stories about food simply because I knew that they could delight or inform. And a, a colleague of mine, Mark Lacey, who's a, another assistant managing editor and who was national editor as I was national editor, when he was um, in Arizona as a bureau chief, I had a conversation with him about chimichangas. And I said, I bet you we could get chimichangas on the front page of the New York Times. We just got to find the right angle. And we did. <laughs> so, so, so really, you always have been involved with food. There was never a time when you were covering something else? Uh, no, I've covered other stuff. But yeah. I've always wanted food to be a part of it. So even when I was national editor, I was writing a food column for the New York Times magazine yeah. once, once a month. Actually, at that point, twice a month. So, but, but where did the interest in food come from? I mean, for, as child, from childhood, or did you always cook, or what? My whole life, I've eaten three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I th when, I got, when I got to college, I needed a job. And I had a roommate who was a bartender at, um, at a fairly fancy restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called The Harvest. And I Harvest was cool, very yes. right? Mary yeah. Mecco design yeah, 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 yeah. and all, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I, I got a job through him as, a, as the cashier. And I wore a little tie, and, I was, and the cashier was also, they didn't have baristas then, they had cashiers. And the cashier also made the coffees. So I made these coffees, and I, I, I once got to make a, a cappuccino for Julia Child. That was, a, that was a highlight, early highlight. But what really interested me were these guys and women who came out of the kitchen, the cooks, the prep cooks, the line cooks, the chef, and ordered, you know, would come up to me with a jelly jar filled with ice and ask for five espressos and 37 sugars, and then they'd go back into this hot, exciting, loud place. And I, it just was really intriguing to me. And so I talked my way into the kitchen. I didn't know how to cook. Um, but I talked my way into the kitchen, worked my way up. I was a prep cook, I worked at Garden Manger, I worked the line, worked grill. And it was really fun and, and a kind of antidote to academic life. And kind of, I didn't realize it at the time, but kind of like journalism in that it, it favored people who, who like to be adrenalized, um, who like a quality of doneness at the end of a shift, like it's over, now we can go to the bar. Um, and a lot of people who questioned authority. <laughs> that was helpful. But you write, uh, but you've written about other things, but you write really beautifully, I think, about oh, uh, food, food. I mean, you, and, you know, very literary references, you know, historical references, great metaphors, like, uh, I love your uh, metaphor for a recipe that is like sheet music. Yeah. So, does... Something about food making you write well? Oh, that's a, or, or is it the other way around? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure. I do believe pretty passionately that, that writing about food is writing about culture, and that restaurant criticism is a form of social history, that the way we think about what we're eating, why we're eating it, why we're eating it now, all of these things help explain the if not the human condition, at least where we're at as a culture in a particular moment, in a particular place. And it's really important to me to take that seriously and not to fall into the, the tropes of food writing that I really dislike. I want to do food journalism, and I want to do food journaling. So I, it, 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 it's important to me to stand strong for the idea that food journalism is a valid form of journalism that, that, and a valid form of culture journalism that helps advance our understanding of the world. 
but it's not merely like, it's delicious. And it's different from being a critic. Oh, yeah. 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 How so? Well, the, the, the critic's job is to, in a restaurant, the critic's job is to figure out what the story of the place is, what the narrative of the, of the restaurant is, and how that squares between the narrative that the, that the customers are telling themselves and the narrative that the restaurant is telling itself and the narrative that the restaurant is telling the customer and the narrative that the customer is telling the restaurant. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I guess the easiest way of explaining um, the joy of restaurant criticism is that you constantly get the chance to explain why a restaurant with not very good food might be a great restaurant. And a restaurant with excellent food might not be a very good restaurant. Why is that? How do we figure that out? How do we tease apart the strands of uh, excellence and lack of excellence mm. to, to tell a story of a place? Because if it's the right place at the right time, you're telling the story of the community that surrounds the restaurant. And that's a, that's a, that's a great gift to be given. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to bring you to the, uh, the home front. Uh, are you the only cook in your house? Are there other cooks, and are they intimidated by you? Everyone's intimidated. <laughs> yeah, right. And is there such a thing as a favorite meal in your house, or is it an, an adventure every night? Well, you know, the, the, the cobbler's children go barefoot. Um, <laughs> the, um, there's, we do have favorite meals, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of work. I have a lot of work to do to develop new recipes all the time, um, and particularly these no recipe recipes, which are just riffs. And those riffs can sometimes uh, be colossal failures that need to be revisited. So it's not as if I'm always serving great food to my family. And it's not as if I'm the only one who can cook in my family, but I'm the one who does it for money, and so I'm the one who has to do it. Um, my wife's a great cook, my kids are great cooks. My kids are actually great pastry cooks, so I rely, on, I'm a terrible pastry chef, so I rely on them for, for sweets, um, but I do, I do most of the cooking, and if, it, if there is a favorite meal, it's, it's when the kids request um, something, you know, where they say, can we, can we have a hot dog party, or can we do yeah. burgers or, or, or tacos? I learned a really interesting thing this week from my younger kid, who's 18, and I... I was exhausted after a day of Zoom and nonsense, and I just, I, I, I didn't want to cook. But I had these amazing frozen dumplings, Korean dumplings in the freezer, and I knew I could make a great meal out of it. And my kid, who loves dumplings, said, no, it's got to be something else. And I, I went full shrink. Like, what's this about? And we talked it out, and it turns out that... <laughs> My kid has this memory of being a, a child, six or seven years old, and, get, and, and, and an exhausted parent, me, serving her fish sticks and, and frozen vegetables, which are frankly awesome. Um, she, she didn't feel that way. And she says to me, a home-cooked meal, like, I don't like things, you can freeze things, but Food that comes out of the freezer, prepared, it's not for me. And I thought, either I'm a good parent or a really bad one. <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk about your first book, which came out 10 years ago. It was called Thanksgiving, How to Cook It Well. Now, um, that came out in 2012. And that began, that came out of your experience on the New York Times of sitting on Thanksgiving Day, presumably, uh, on the help desk. They had a Thanksgiving help desk. That sounds fancy. Yeah, it was yeah. me. Yeah, right, right. So, so, you know, why a Thanksgiving help desk? Or do people need more help at Thanksgiving than they do at Christmas or oh Easter? My God, or, yes. Oh and my God, what, what kind of help? I mean, I, I need emotional help usually on Thanksgiving. I'm, I'm, I'm here for that as well. Yeah, right, so, right. Thanksgiving, this, this great American secular holiday that we all share, which is not true of Christmas or Easter, not true of Ramadan. It's not true, right? Like er, Thanksgiving is there for one and all, even with its incredibly difficult path, history. Right? It is nevertheless celebrated by all Americans in, in, in some form. 
And every year, it's the same questions. People don't, they look at this giant bird and they freak out. They realize that there are 15 people coming to dinner and they freak out. And they seek guidance. And for a time, they sought guidance from, from the New York Times, where I was very happy to sit there with, uh, with my computer terminal and didn't take calls like the Butterball team. Um, and it all came in via, via email or, or blog comment. And I had my sources so I could go and kind of explain everything. And I did it year after year after year. And it was, it was great, in part because there was a lot of emotional help to offer people in their time of stress and worry. And I thought, you know, you know what's really needed? There are a million Thanksgiving books, a million Thanksgiving lessons, but there's no Hoyle's book of rules or whatever it's called, the card game rule book. Hoyle's, I think it's called Hoyle's, Hoyle, right? According to Hoyle. So I thought there needs to be a Thanksgiving according to Hoyle. And I'm the guy to write it. Like, I, the Times is not unnoted for its arrogance. Um, and so I, I thought, I can, I can do that. I can, I can explain how to cook Thanksgiving well. It's not going to be fancy. We're not going to be doing, you know, we're not changing anything up. It's going to be turkey and a full spread. And if I do that in a way that is bossy and kind, it may be of some service to people. And I think it has been. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I've read the book and I like it. And I've also been to Thanksgiving at your house. That's true. And I would say that it's it was maybe 30 or 40 people all seated at tables in every conceivable configuration. And uh, it was a wonderful time. Yeah, that was that, that, that year was the soup kitchen year, it seemed. Like we, I, it's so difficult to figure out how to get everybody in. We, that, I think we had different tables there. Yeah. Tiny, it's not a big enough house to have the, all these people in. And we've been trying different ways, and then COVID just took it away from yeah. us. And I, I mean, Thanksgiving 2020, table for four? That was, I've been cooking Thanksgiving for over 20 people for over 20 years. It was really yeah. shocking. I got a lot of mileage out of that, though. I had told all my friends that I was going to um, Sam Sifton's house for Thanksgiving, and they were like, what? You know Sam Sifton? So, um, anyway. So now your second book, which came out only three years ago, 2019, is that right? Um, and it was called See You on Sunday, and how would you describe that? Uh, spectacularly mistimed. <laughs> it, it's a cookbook for family and friends. The argument being that gathering together in groups, um, accepting strangers, inviting strangers into your home on a regular cadence is a good thing to do for yourself and for your community and, and for your larger ambit of friends. Um, I really do believe that, that if you can get into uh, a regular cadence of cooking and people know and hear about the fact that there's a meal on a Sunday. It doesn't have to be a Sunday. It's a religious, not religious argument, right? Um, it could be on a Wednesday. But if people are aware that there's cooking at Sifton's house on, generally on Thursdays and come to depend on it and come to enjoy it and bring a friend, there can, some magic can happen. Yeah. Um, but of course, some infection can happen as well. So <laughs> the, the the arrival of, of COVID put a put a dent in yeah, yeah. in see you on Sunday, which was sort of a bummer. But I encourage you to go to the library and read it, and if you like it, to buy to it. Buy I'm not it. asking you to, to buy, buy it. it. I would never ask you to buy it at a library event. I, I thought I thought it was for sale here, but maybe. okay, buy it. Buy it. <laughs> it's in, it's an invaluable. Yeah, right. But I have a line. Okay, so I was reading it. And you know, I told you that when I read the introduction to See You on Sunday, I wept because it was so moving about this idea of getting people together and the importance of it. So this line struck me, though. Uh, if you don't particularly like entertaining, even if you don't particularly like entertaining, there is great pleasure to be had in cooking for others and great pleasure to be taken from the experience of a gathering to eat with others. And it seems to me that that's in all the books that I've read of yours, which is all of them, um, that that's your great through line, that food is connection, and that the point of what you're trying to do is not get people to do a recipe well, uh, but to enjoy the process. Uh, so many cookbooks, you know, you feel like, you know, there's, 
you've got to do it exactly right. But you coax people into enjoying it. Yeah, the, but the point is just, the point is not the cooking. I mean, sometimes it is very much mm. about the cooking. But if, if what you're trying to do is impress with the schmuck yeah, yeah. that, right. that you're doing, then that's about you. But if what you're trying to do is feed others, then that's about other people. And that's a far more important thing to do. And, you know, that line is, and I'm, I'm glad you quoted that line, because I don't particularly like entertaining. I just don't. Um, I love feeding people, and I love people in my home. And Brendan McCarthy will tell you, like, the reason I like being in the kitchen and feeding people is because then I don't have to be in the living room talking to people. <laughs> but I love feeding. Um, and and, and the, the, all the kind of, like, the way that bounces off the... the the way it disagrees with itself as a, as a way of, of living your life and, and cooking um, is pleasing to me, and I think and I think helpful to the others. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. So now the book that everybody's going to buy tonight, either buy or, or already has tonight, um, the No Recipe Recipes, which was done with the New York Times. Um, I know that you offer a regular feature that's a kind of No Recipe Recipe, but what uh, induced you to so I write a newsletter for the New York Times um, that's called What to Cook, and it comes out four times a week, and it's like an albatross around my neck. I love doing it. I love the kind of dopamine hit I get from sending it out into the world and having people write in and, and enjoy it and, and talk about it. Um, but at when, when I'm feeling particularly low, it's just a list of recipes that I'm hyping. I'm just a carnival barker at the front of the New York Times cooking app saying, hey, let's make chicken marbala, everybody. And I needed to figure out ways in that newsletter to keep myself interested and to keep the readers of the newsletter interested. And I knew that that wouldn't just be the damn recipes. It couldn't always be, hey, we got a new recipe for chicken piccata. So what then could I do to bring in the interest of the, of the readers. And, and there were two things that I figured I could do. One is to recognize that food is never just about food, and dinner is never just about what you manage to pull off in your kitchen. It's about the movie you just saw, or the song you just listened to, or the book you just read, or the piece of art that you just saw, or the book of poetry you just checked out of the library and enjoyed. And I needed to bring that into the newsletter, and then I also needed to bring into the newsletter this notion that let's not take the business of recipes all that seriously, particularly as we go through, as we went through the lockdowns of the early kind of well-written seasons of coronavirus. I think the later seasons with these variants, terrible writing. Um, but you know, what can we do to say, hey, you guys know how to cook. You subscribe to New York Times cooking. You're cooking four or five times a week. You know how to cook. You don't always have to follow a recipe. So here's a prompt for a recipe. And those prompts came about because I spend a lot of time talking to professional chefs. And I spend a lot of time talking to home cooks. But professional chefs in particular, terrible recipe writers. They speak in a kind of shorthand to people who know what they're talking about. And they can kind of indicate to a line cook, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do X, then I want you to make a Bernays sauce and put it on X. So, we don't need a recipe for the Bernays sauce. Well, maybe one does, but the, the notion is there's a sort of shorthand between the chef and, and who he's talking to, that if you listen to it carefully and you have a, a few skills, you're going to make a pretty good meal. And so I thought, maybe let's give that a shot. So every Wednesday for a bunch of years, I would write these no recipe recipes. They're just like chord charts for songs that you know you can make into your own. And then eventually we thought, maybe we should try this as a book. Yeah. And so we the, did. The, the photographs are unbelievable. Oh, those and, guys. and and they, the, the the recipes look so good. They look good. I mean, the ingredients seem so good. So the ingredients are cool. I hope the description of the recipe, I mean, no recipe recipe, it's a recipe. It's just a different kind of recipe, right? So I'm hoping that the combination of those two things allow people to make the recipe 
her own or his own. Like, yeah, and I, I think that take more pleasure in it. Yeah, because yeah. you're reading into it what you know. Right. Um, so I have a desert island question. Rup <laughs> Okay. So you're you're stranded on a desert island, and inexplicably, there's all the food you could imagine. Oh, great. Yeah. So that's great. Uh, but you only get to bring three condiments, either condiments, spices, or herbs. Only three of those. And what are they, and why? Wow. Do those herbs last forever? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Endless supply, but only those. Yeah, three. yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. Okay. I got it. I got it. I definitely going to take some chili crisp, which is a kind of um, it, uh, it's a Chinese condiment of of oil and spicy peppers and Sichuan peppercorn, so spicy, numbing, tingly. I'm on a desert island. That pork that I have might go off a little bit. I'm on a nice, powerful unguent that can go onto it to, to make it taste better in any circumstance. Um, I spend, would I get sick of Old Bay? No, I don't think I would. So I'm going to also have some Old Bay seasoning just because you can use it for a lot of different yeah, yeah. things. I once tried to make an Old Bay ice cream and it almost worked. Um, and then I've gone to the Delmarva Peninsula and to China and Asia, so i got to get one more, and it's going to be maple syrup. Oh, maple syrup. And if I can combine the maple syrup, the chili crisp, and the old bay, I win chopped. Okay, so that's that's it. That's your answer. That's my Final answer, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, right. All right. Well, um, so you're still on the desert island. You're an avid fisherman. Yes. Yeah, but you are that. And is there any connection between fishing and cooking for you? There's definitely connections between fishing and writing. Um, I'm not a big harvester of, of fish. I, I practice the art of catch and release, or no catch, no release. That happened today. Um, um, but I, I, I'm not a big meat fisherman. Um, and I kind of, you know, you look, if you spend any time in marinas where, where there are charter boats coming in and you see a great number of really beautiful game fish um, processed for the sports. And you realize that those pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of meat are going to go into freezers and then <laughs> potentially not be consumed or used. Yeah. It seems like a terrible waste. There's nothing I like better than, than being able to target a, a species that is not endangered, that is delicious, and that will bring me pleasure later at the dinner table, and I, I do that a fair amount, not all the time, but I do that a fair amount, and, it, and it's lovely, and, and there's something truly magical, and this is true of hunting as well as fishing, of eating wild animals, um, but I'm not a fisherman in order to get meat from my table. Right. So um, in cooking, what stumps you, or what, do you have a good disaster story? There are so many disasters. Um, there's so many disasters. One of the things that I love to do is travel and um, visit with people. And I'm always game to cook. And I'm game to cook with your terrible knife, with your warped uh, pot, um, with your balky uh, oven, or even worse, grill. And I've had so many hilarious and wonderful to me moments with, with bad grills. Um, and I, I recount one of them in, in See You on Sunday as part of my argument toward um, cooking more uh, vegetables than, than meat, where I had this grill that was, and I, I, I thought I had it all dialed in, but somehow 20 minutes into it, I went to check on these two uh, chickens that I, w I was cooking, smoke roasting, and they were just incinerated. It was just like little black hockey pucks with wings, and I just had I had, I had to get rid of them, and then convert on the fly this um, chicken dinner into a summer vegetable dinner, and it worked out. Um, so it wasn't a total disaster, except in my heart where it really was. Well, there was also the one that I read about that was the um, the 
deep fried turkey. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so deep fried turkey, one of the great treats in the American South and something I've done a gajillion times. But the first time I did it was on um, a street corner in uh, the uh, Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and a couple things happened. One, um, we used a brined bird. Um, and what happened when that brine bird went into the hot oil <laughs> is that a lot of the brine converted to steam and the breasts blew off. <laughs> so that was the first problem. Then the second problem was it was an enameled pot, uh, so an aluminum enameled pot and not a stainless steel pot, which I didn't really, I was like 25, what do I know? Um, but the candy thermometer, because I'm a professional, that I was using to measure the heat of the oil, what oil was left after the breasts blew off, um, pierced the bottom of the pot. And now what oil remained was pouring onto the propane hob. So a lot of things were going wrong at that point. And, and that's when the police showed up. And, <laughs> Luckily, I also had a grill where I had some burgers going, and I, I gave the cop a, a, a hamburger, <laughs> and he ate it and was cool, because I said, look, I have kitty litter to mop up the spilt oil. So we didn't have the turkey that night. But I was undaunted, and I really do believe that a, a deep fried turkey is a wonderful, wonderful protein for, for Thanksgiving or any other time. Yeah, I've never had one, but... but Ellen, we're going to change that. Yeah, okay. okay. So now, are you working on a cookbook now? I don't ever want to write another book ever. No. Um, <laughs> writing a book is a tough and solitary act. And when you got a job like mine, which is um, you know, managing people and, and, and working with people, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's hard. Got a lot of responsibilities at the paper um, that involve managing and involve writing. And finding that time to really put your mind into a book is, yeah. is complicated. I could see doing another No Recipe Recipe book because I have a lot of those in the sack. Mm -hmm. um, and I could figure out a way to, to, to zhuzh that up. Um, but if I were to write another big book, let's say not a cookbook, I think I would have to not be doing the job that I'm doing right now yeah. in order to really give it the... But I, that's what I say after every single one yeah, of these Yeah, I mean, things. you've written three in ten yeah, years, and yeah. you've been doing these jobs. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess I'll write another one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you don't know what it is right now. I don't. Yeah. I don't. It, probably outdoor cooking. But. Okay, well, pretty soon I'm going to turn this over to you guys. Right. But I did want to mention, I mean, I didn't want to close our conversation without mentioning that you come from a uh, uh, great literary family in New York. Uh, your mother, Elizabeth Sifton, was a prominent intellectual in New York. She was a editor for Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And your grandfather, the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, wrote the Serenity Prayer. You all know what the Serenity Prayer is, don't you? I can, I can read it here. Here, let me just read it. Because God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And, you know, that's, of course, Everywhere, ubiquitous now, um, due to AA. Did you know your grandfather? Did you ever talk to him about the inspiration for that? Poem? I did know him, but I, I was not old enough to talk to him about that prayer or any other prayer. He was a sort of spectral figure in my young life, mm. um, quite old and infirm. Um, he was quite a bit older than my grandmother, so when I was young, he was really old. Mm. And... Um, so I mostly remember, quite frankly, I mostly remember him as a as a bedridden oh. person of who was super scared, um, if only because he was quite large and and which I mean tall and and old and infirm. But uh, his um, influence loomed large over my uh, still looms large over over my life and and I'm. I, I feel a powerful connection to him in the work that I do and, and whenever I, I, I read his, his work. It's interesting, on, the, on, my other, on the other side of my family, my grandfather was a, was a newspaper man, um, as was his wife, my grandmother. And my 
grandfather Paul Sifton was the Sunday editor of the New York World until, as we say in the Sifton family, the world ended. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I see, I see, par I, I see a familiar. I, I kind of feel I'm just doing the family business on both sides. Yeah, yeah, not so. Um, so now we can turn it over to the audience. Um, so, Sam, do you want to just pick people yes. when you see their... Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, back in the late 70s, I was in the restaurant business in Manhattan, and the New York Times restaurant with you every week, Mamie Sheraton was the revered and feared um, critic, um, but she had profound influence. And I just wonder if today, with the, there's so much more information available about restaurants oh, for sure. and opinions and so on, I was wondering, does the New York Times still have that sort of reverential... Oh, of course it does. I'm, I'm going to repeat your question yeah, okay. for those in, in the back. So um, our questioner ran, was in the restaurant business in the 1970s in, in New York City in Manhattan at a time when Mimi Sheridan was the feared and, and famed uh, restaurant critic for the New York Times. Um, Mimi may have been able, I'm not embellishing, but Mimi may have been able to make or break a restaurant. Is that still the case now that we have this democratized world of restaurant criticism, our friends from Yelp and TripAdvisor, the blogs and, 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 and the like? Can the feared Pete Wells, um, uh, you know, walk through Manhattan with this, with this, with the power of Mimi Sheridan, and the answer is yes and no, more no than yes. Um, Mimi Sheridan is still with us, still alive. Um, I, I spoke to Mimi. I met Mimi for the first time uh, 15 years ago when I was working on the food desk at the Times, and I and I said, Mimi, it's such a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Um, what do you think of the food coverage at the Times right now? And she said, Not much. And I was like, wow, she's still got it. Um, another great mini story. I, I looked up, I reviewed a, um, a restaurant called Palm 2, which is one of the Palm steakhouses in New York. And I thought it was, for whatever reason, I thought this, it was it's half a chain. Like, there are palms all over the place. And I was like, but this Palm, Palm 2 is really good. Like, what's going on here? And I did some research and saw that Mimi Sheridan had given it uh, three stars in 74 or something like that. And I looked in the fine print where the stars are explained and, and the dishes you must order and and there was a great thing where it said where it said price $42 per person with three scotches each. And I thought, wow, Mimi, coming in strong. Um, it was just Mimi. It was just Craig Claiborne before her. You know, it was, should be, it was basically just Ruth Reichel after all of that, and, 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 and Brian Miller, and all those guys, Biff Grimes, eventually me. But yeah, there are all these others out there who are passing judgment on restaurants in New York and in, in Key West. And, you know, are they right? I don't know. You go to the restaurant and, and, and see. I don't think TripAdvisor or Yelp is going to make or break a place. Might be a pain in the but for the restaurateur, or somebody, or it might be great for for the restaurateur, but the job of a big city newspaper restaurant critic is not the same. It's not to say the food's lousy and the portions are tiny. The job of the of the restaurant critic is to say this is why this restaurant matters, doesn't matter, is important, isn't important, is succeeding, is failing, um, is doing okay, is you know, etc. And I think Pete Wells continues to do that, and I think the New York Times is going to continue to do that for a long time. I just think that now that we're more than a national newspaper, but an international newspaper, we have to figure out a way to cover much more of the country and the world and its restaurants in ways that are complementary to the thousand-word review that drops on, on Wednesday in your in your well, in your in your printed paper when it arrives. Because you're all subscribers, I know. I hope you are. Who do we got? No. Way in the back. No. I'm here. Um, everybody, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody I know um, subscribes to New York Times Cooking, and we all love it. Can you tell me a little bit about the growth of, the, um, of it and how many subscribers you have now? 
Oh, I'd love nothing more than to do that. So the question was about the birth and, and, and spectacular growth of New York Times cooking, um, which now has more than one million paying subscribers, which is really cool. I mean, that's like... The Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe together don't have a million subscribers for their whole paper. We've got a million subscribers for our New York Times cooking and a million subscribers for our games app. And, and we just bought Wordle today, if you're playing Wordle. Um, um, and then, you know, seven million subscribers to the New York Times. So we're, we're doing okay on, on, on subscriptions. Um, but. You know, there were not a lot of people at the New York Times when we started cooking who thought that was going to happen. There were a lot of doubters. There were a lot of people who thought, you can go to the World Wide Web and get a recipe for roast pork. Why should the Times be charging for its um, recipe for roast pork? And the answer is, quite frankly, good luck with your Google recipe for roast pork. If you come to the Times, here's a, here's a reported, tested, excellent recipe with a, with a good piece of reporting behind it. And we thought that that would work. Why did we think it would work? Do you remember the New York Times cookbook by Craig Claiborne? Yeah. How many people had that? See? That book was written when the New York Times wasn't an international newspaper, wasn't a national newspaper, wasn't a metropolitan newspaper. It was a city newspaper. And yet Craig Claiborne, and it was Craig's book, not the Times's. That was his great genius, was to, the New York Times cookbook belonged to Craig Claiborne. No recipe recipes, New York Times cooking, that belongs to the Salzburgers, not to me. I missed the boat on that one. Um, but he was able to, to collect, under the, under the banner of the New York Times, recipes that went back decades, and that were like the ones in New York Times cooking today, deeply reported, exquisitely tested, delicious, and make it a national bestseller. And a national bestseller at a time when the New York Times wasn't a national newspaper. And I thought from the very beginning we can capture that lightning in a bottle again. We just got to do it on the phone. And that's what we've done. And we're going to keep doing it. And we're going to keep going. And thank you for that question. Nice day All right, we're good. Kale seems to be on the way out. What do you see as new trends in foods? Okay, I, I missed what's on the way out. Kale. Kale's on the way out? Yeah, kale's been on the way out for a while now, right? I love kale. I'm sorry to see it go. I hope we'll continue to... Uh, I mean, what's the new kale? Collards, probably. Because um, you need a leafy green, and you want a nice, tough leafy green. I, I'm not a prognosticator on, on trends. Um, you know, is this going to be the year of cardamom? Is this going to be the year that Korean food finally breaks through? I'm not entirely sure, but I love watching it. And one of the places you, you see it is in, is in restaurants, right? You see like, that there was a point where everybody had calamari and it, you had to have a fried calamari. Now, we're at a moment where you don't really have to have anything other than a roast chicken and a piece of salmon somewhere <laughs> in, in a restaurant, and you need a chicken recipe and a salmon recipe on New York Times cooking, because otherwise people are going to go crazy. Um, I'm dodging your question because I'm always wrong, and so I have no idea, except I, I did say College of the New Kale, and I'm sticking with it. I have nothing <laughs> to back that up except the force of my personality. Yes, ma'am. So do I watch TV cooking shows? No. I did a lot when the kids were little. Um, they loved competition shows. Um, um, my younger one was sick the other day and demanded that we watch Great British Bake Off together, which I found delightful and, and great. But I really, at the, at the end of a long day of dealing with food, I, I don't, I don't want to watch a competition show. Um, and I find... We're off the record, right? We're going to be quiet. We're not going to talk about stuff. I find those mind of a chef shows 
to be so wildly pretentious and over the top that I just can't. And that's on me, not on the filmmakers who do a brilliant job. It's just like it's just not it's just not for me. I gotta I gotta take a break. I wanna watch dark Scandinavian crime. Well, is there, are there any more? There's one. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um I will say, I will say this. The thing that I'm one of the things that I am most proud of with the New York, with New York Times cooking is that we don't have comments. If you look closely, it's notes. And that's a little bit of virtue signaling on our part, and I had to fight really hard to get it because comments are the coin of the realm in the world of, of the internet. But I know that comments always devolve into political arguments. And you know, the quiche Lorraine becomes a litmus test about whether you're a Trumper or a, you know, whatever. So I didn't want any of that in our world. I wanted a helpful community where users of the app could say, I actually increased the salt or decreased the sugar or used a different temperature or whatever, and people could talk among one another. Um, and, and I'm relieved, I'm excited to say that that has been the case for New York Times Cooking, that people are just kind of kind-hearted and good, and we don't have a lot of vicious debate. Um, under our recipes for quiche Lorraine and, and others. But there is a great one in there about, um, a, a, about a recipe that's terrific, and, but then the, the, the woman, the place that they got the recipe from, the, the woman stole her husband, and now she doesn't make it anymore. I like that. So maybe one more, one more. Yes. Yeah, I wish that were the case. Okay, so those those cultural recommendations that follow the um, that follow the hawking of the recipes and whatever moralizing I have at the top. I mean, I'm sorry, folks. That's how the, that's how the sausage is made. Where does where do those items come from? And quite frankly, they come. That's my job is to is to find them, and it's one of the things that makes journalism great is that it's part of my job to, to know w w what's in Chelsea right now in the galleries and, and what's, a, you know, what's the new music and what are the books that are worth talking about. And, and I'm really lucky because I have a job where I oversee the coverage of all of that stuff. And I oversee travel, culture, books, real estate, food, blah, blah. All of that stuff kicks up information that if it intrigues me, I hope it intrigues you, and I can and I can put it into the and I can put it into the newsletter to the I hope to the delight of a few um, and to the fury of very few. Um, so it, I mean, it's a little. Weird. I check my traps. I'm trolling all the time. There are various metaphors I can use, but I, what I'm what I'm looking for is the shock of the news, something exciting, or something old to, to delight because it's someone's birthday, or, um, th there's a science to it. I'm checking stuff. I'm checking publications. I'm checking what we're publishing. I'm checking what happened this day in history. Um, and it's a delight. It's actually one of the best parts of the job. So thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, we'll just do the one more right here. Yes. So the question is, have I ever cooked with any of the, my colleagues uh, on New York Times Cooking? And the answer is yes. Um, for He's no longer a colleague, but for a long time, I, we did, Mark Bittman and I did a, a shtick for the New York Times Magazine where they would send us somewhere and we would have to cook a feast in a day. Um, and Mark, one of, one of my favorite people in the world, is also really irascible. And um, it was so great to, to be able to kind of like tussle with him over the course of a day cooking. I've cooked Thanksgiving uh, soup to nuts in a day in a single oven set to 400 degrees with Melissa Clark. Um, I've, I, I, yeah, I've, I, it's such a thrill to be able to cook with those guys because they're really good. Um, and I, I can document that. 
Um, and we just built, and you're going to see more and more over the coming weeks and months and years, we built a, a studio kitchen in New York um, on the west side of Manhattan, about 10 blocks away from um, our headquarters on 628th Avenue, where we have two set up studio kitchens where we can cook together and, as the kids say, make content. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting into that um, as soon as we're able to do so safely and to cook with even more of them. Thank, thank you all for coming. I think nice. the book is there.